Happy Sunday, everyone. Welcome in here online. I hope you're ready for a great morning together and expectant for how God's going to move among us as we continue in our series on being disciples, earnestly and passionately following after Jesus. I've already been encouraged by the messages in this series so far about how disciple of Jesus believes and learns and prays. And I'm really looking forward to what today has to offer us, what God has to offer us. Throughout our time, we'd love to pray with you. If you want to join with someone on our team in a one-on-one -on -one chat, just click request prayer anytime to pray for whatever you'd like to share. I'm glad you're a part today. Let's head over and then I will see you all in just a bit. Good morning, Christ Chapel. It's a great day to worship the Lord together. I am so glad I get to be here with you this morning. My name is Wendy Lyon. I'm part of the women's ministry here at Christ Chapel. Welcome. If you are a guest with us, we'd love to introduce ourselves to you and get to know you and send you information about Christ Chapel and help you get connected. And the very best way to do that is to have you fill out this orange connect card. It's in the seat back in front of you. And we would love to know all about you, but just as much information as you're comfortable with. Also in the seat back in front of you is a blue prayer card. We are a praying church. We would love to come alongside you and pray for you. Those prayers can be big or small. Um, we will pray for you this week. If you're joining us online, click the link in the chat and it'll take you to both those cards. Take those cards, go out to the great room and drop them off in the offering box. Well, next Sunday, we have another opportunity for prayer on Sunday afternoon at 1230, right here in the sanctuary. Our elders and their wives will be here. They would love to spend time with you and get to know you, but they are here to pray for you, to encourage you, and pray for any healing you might be experiencing in your life right now. God can do extraordinary things when we come to him in prayer. So make plans to come next week and join us with the elders and their wives. And you can find more about that prayer day on the back of your sermon notes. Well, we have a great hour of worship ahead of us. But first, let's get to know one another. Would you please stand up and say good morning to someone around you? together.
Thank you. Maybe may be seated. Amen and praise God. We are going to continue to worship Christ Chapel. We're going to continue in worship in how we celebrate baptisms. We've got five baptisms this morning uh, and incredible stories. And so we're going to tell some stories and they're beautiful because they always are. Because when salvation comes into our life, it is a beautiful thing uh, in every single story, the mercy of God and the goodness of God. And baptism is a picture of that. Uh, It is an outward picture of an inward commitment and covenant and decision for these believers who have said, my life is no longer my own, Uh, much like a wedding ring, right? A a wedding ring is the outward picture. uh, It's the profession to others that I am in a covenant relationship. And in the same way, baptism is this obedient step that these believers have taken to say publicly, I profess my life is not my own. My trust is fully in Jesus for the forgiveness of my sins. And it's an awesome thing. I, I oftentimes think of Galatians 2.20 when I think about baptism. Uh, This idea that Paul says he is crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives within me. And it's this idea of baptism of being dunked underwater. And so going underwater symbolizing uh, our old self being dead and buried, crucified with Christ. And then the newness of life. Paul says, yes, I've been crucified and the old life is gone, but now the new life I live in the flesh, I live in faith for the one who loved me and gave himself up for me. And so that's what we're going to celebrate. That is a worshipful thing. Uh, Abigail is our first baptism uh, here uh, at the, this service and excited. She's going to come on out here and she's also going to be joined by her dad, Michael. Uh, her mom, Jennifer, is here as well. Hi, Abigail. You stand up on this. Um, Abigail, and this is her dad, Michael, uh, who's going to stand right here in the, in the water with us and um, and the, the, also the beautiful picture of uh, a, heavenly fa- a heavenly father who, who also gives us earthly fathers, who are these examples. And earthly dads are imperfect. You're not perfect, are you? No, I'm not. Okay, not perfect. <laughs> but a picture and a shadow of this heavenly father that Abigail has put her trust and faith in. And, and Abigail, it was at kids camp, uh, really, that, I mean, you've grown up in this family that's talked about Jesus and, and modeled Jesus for you had this incredible family that showed you that. But then even kids camp, things really started to click. But that was over a year ago. And, and you really took time to really think through it and process it and make this decision really personal. So we as a church are so proud and we're so uh, honored that we get to be a part of this. But also we're so grateful that, uh, that you have put your faith in God. So um, I'm going to baptize you now. So question I'm going to ask for you uh, is have you put your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And is he your savior? Okay, then it's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes, thanks, Dad. Appreciate you, Michael. Awesome, awesome. Okay, next up, we've got my sister in Christ, Brittany. Brittany is going to come on out here. Uh, I love Brittany's story. I've loved getting to know her. Um, This is a a good one. Brittany, come on out. Join us. <clears throat> we love you. Um, okay, I'm going to tell a little bit of your story. Is that, is that cool? These are all family. Um, so, and, and that's so much a part of her story, even when we were chatting, just how at home you feel in, in this community, even here at Christ Chapel. So uh, Brittany works at McDonald's and uh, Miss Kathy, right? Miss, Miss Kathy went through the drive through Guys, listen to this. Went through the drive-thru, and you guys built a relationship, and she started loving and encouraging and really showing you Jesus through the drive-thru. So she eats a lot of McDonald's, first off. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Either that, either that, or she really loves Jesus and really loves you and is always looking to show that. And y'all built a relationship in the drive-thru. You guys started walking together. You would even take your breaks whenever she was around eventually in chat. And about a year ago, she started saying, well, do you want to get a part of this church and this community? And so you've been coming here for now a year. Uh, You have had a faith in Jesus. Um, You've been through some really hard things. You've moved here, and you found community, which even we're going to hear in the sermon today, the community of God that's loved you and accepts you. But most importantly, you've got a God who loves you and accepts you and died for you, and you've put your faith in that. What an incredible encouragement this is to us, and thank you for letting us be a part of it. So um, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you put your trust in Jesus and Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Okay, then it's my honor to get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Proud of you, sister. Proud of you. Awesome. Praise God. Praise God. 
awesome to see a gospel click. Uh, Tyler's going to come on out next, I believe. Uh, Tyler is a guy I've gotten to connect with recently. Yes. Um, uh, Tyler's story is also super encouraging to me. Hey, brother. Um, uh, Tyler's didn't grow up in um, a, a really religious home. Uh, church attendance wasn't a huge part of your life growing up, and Jesus wasn't a huge part of your life growing up, but it was a huge part of your grandmother's life. And she was devout, and she loved the Lord, and she just had her eyes on Jesus in a way that even when you were young and didn't really click for you or make sense, you saw your grandmother. And she passed away a few years ago. And when she passed away, uh, Tyler, for whatever reason, the Holy Spirit just started working in his heart after she passed away and said, I, partly just to honor her, right, to say, I'm going to start going to church. Uh, there's a church down the street. You were in Frisco at the time, right? And you started showing up at this church, and God started doing something in your life where that thing that your grandmother had personally started to become personal for you. Uh, and I love that. And also, just as an encouragement, so many uh, of us, so many people here are, have loved ones, maybe grandkids or kids that you so badly want to know Jesus. Um, and I just think it's amazing that the fruit of your grandmother's faithfulness, she didn't get to see in in her lifetime, but the fruit of it just rippled throughout her life as you've now become, started dating, you got engaged, and your fiance too, uh, where is she? Yeah, awesome. When, when's the big day? Uh, October next uh, year. October next year. We're all invited, guys. Um, <laughs> so, no, no, never mind, never mind, we're not. Um, uh, yeah, um, we'll cater McDonald's, it'll be awesome. Um, <clears throat> I, I know somebody. Um, it's incredible to see even your relationship with your fiance then was built on faith. Like y'all started going to church together and this thing and even her influence growing up in a spiritual home and being somebody who loved the Lord. And it's been so cool to get to chat with you and hear your, your story and testimony. And then finally the gospel clicking. This idea that you can't do it. You can't, it's not about your grandmother and, and living the way she did. It's about the relationship with Jesus. And, and that's a beautiful thing. So thank you for letting us get to celebrate and be inspired by you. So I'm going to baptize you, my brother. I'm going to ask you this question. Have you put your trust fully in Jesus and Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And is he your Savior? Absolutely. Then it is my honor to get to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yes. Proud of you, man. Awesome. <clears throat> All right, two, two more, um, and this is the Bonabergs, and so they're going to come on out at this point. Um, uh, I love every one of these. Again, this is a story of death to life. This is a part of worship, and so as the Bonabergs come out, this is Brant right here. Uh, Brant, I'm going to give you this stool here so that everyone can get to see you well. Oh, slipping on me, sorry. Um, so yeah, step up on there. Uh, now, this is Brant and, and Kevin, uh, father, son here. And I love y'all's story because, Brant, it was what you were at kids camp, it was, but you were like six at the time. So this was years ago. You're way older now. But it, you were six at the time. And Brant was like, man, I want to get baptized. I believe this Jesus. He's grown up in this incredible family, parents who love the Lord. Um, and, and you were like, man, I want to get baptized. Now, Kevin, you grew up Catholic, and you had never been baptized. Uh, as a, as a baby you had, but as an adult, this profession of faith as an adult to say, hey, my life is not my own, was something. And so when Brant came to Kevin and said, hey, mom, dad, I think I want to do this, how cool is it that you inspired your dad to say, that's a public profession that I want to make also. Um, that is awesome that you are obedient to this, this step that God's done, but also I am inspired by you as a dad who says, man, I want to do this with my son. I love it, man. Praise God. I don't, I'm not going to cry. We're good, we're good here. Um, <laughs> I'm proud of you. Um, have you placed your faith in Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? Do you trust him as your Savior? Yes. Okay, then I am so honored to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Good job, bro. All right. Brother. Have you placed your faith in Christ and Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins? And have you put your trust in him as your Savior? Yes. Yes, yes. you have. Yes. Praise God. It's my honor to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. <laughs> you too. Let's worship.
Wow, what a joy it is to see uh, folks on their journey uh, with the Lord, their journey of faith, their journey of public baptism. And we as a church body get to look and rejoice, don't we? We get to respond with thanks and praise to God. We're going to do that now through this next song, which is a song that I will sing the first line and you repeat after me. It's called uh, Lord Most High. It's kind of an echo song. So we'll do it that way and then sing the chorus together. Uh, But it speaks of uh, the the journey, Uh, the journey from sadness, the journey to the joy, the journey one day where we get to worship uh, in the endless ages for all eternity. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together. The ends of the earth, from the depths of the sea, from the heights of the heaven, your name be praised. From the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people. This song we raise, Lord, throughout the endless ages, you will be crowned with praises, Lord, most high, exalted in every nation, sovereign. depths of the sea, from the heights of the heaven, your name be praised, from the hearts of the weak, from the shouts of the strong, from the lips of all people, this song to magnify the Lord, let's continue to worship Him through the giving of our resources. Really the giving back of the resources which He has richly lavished on us. This morning we have the opportunity to give cheerfully and with gratitude in our hearts for what God has done for us. Remember Christ Chapel family, there are three ways you can give this morning. Uh, The first is you can give online, Uh, that works. The second one is in person, that's out there in the lobby. And the third way is if you text the number on the screen, text GIVE to 25243, uh, that will be the third avenue uh, in which you can give this morning. If you're a guest today, uh, please know that we don't expect anything from you. You've already blessed us with your presence. Giving is something that we get to do as a church family, and we are just glad guests that you are here with us. We want you to feel welcome. You know that Christ Chapel Disaster Relief Ministry sends teams of volunteers into disaster areas to provide hope, help, and healing in Jesus' name. 
uh, in response to the devastating impacts of Hurricane Helene and Milton, we are taking action. Uh, a team of volunteers is traveling to Perry, Florida at the end of this month in partnership with Samaritan's Purse. Uh, the first hurricane, Helene, uh, made landfall with pretty strong winds over 140 miles per hour, making it the strongest storm to impact that region in recorded history. It also caused catastrophic flooding in parts of North Carolina, Tennessee, and Virginia, and unfortunately claimed over 200 lives. This past week, we saw that Hurricane Milton struck Florida uh, with high winds, flooding, and a storm surge, uh, but it also had a huge impact with tornadoes. Uh, there were 126 tornado warnings, which is a one-day record for the state. Uh, but because of your faithful giving, Christ Chapel, you were able to quickly send $25,000 to Samaritan's Purse last week, followed by an additional $50,000 this week to support the response. Isn't that wonderful? Church, you've been so uh, faithful, and so we want to say thank you to that. Uh, if you'd like to contribute to that, you can uh, do that. On, there's a QR code uh, on the screen that you'll be able to access, but also that should be on your worship notes uh, as well. On the back of your sermon notes, there is a QR code uh, that, that which you can use to do that as well. So uh, would you join me as we commit our offerings and our gifts to the Lord in prayer? Gracious Father, thank you for allowing us to give and to be blessed in the giving of our resources. Thank you for your gracious protection over so many in that affected area of our country with these storms. Father, we continue to pray for them, for their protection, for peace of mind and comfort. Lord, for many to turn in faith to you. Lord, we continue to pray for those who are helping them, for their safety and for their witness. Lord, I pray for all of the logistics to work so that they can make the hard-to-reach areas accessible. Father, we continue to pray that our resources would further the message of the gospel, the truth that we all need in good times and in times of trouble, the hope that we share through the person and work of your son, Jesus. Lord, in our giving, we want you to be glorified and magnified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
I'm Christy, and I've known Hannah for probably seven or eight years. We met through serving together um, in Soul Care. We were both um, co-mentor coaches for Thrive, and our friendship just blossomed from there. To know Hannah is to um, know what it is to be with someone who loves community. She loves people incredibly well. She just thinks of you like you're the only person she knows. Um, I mean, when you're with her, she makes you feel like you're the most important person in the room, which, I mean, is the embodiment of Jesus. I am grateful to have friends that are iron sharpening friends, and she's one of those. And so it pushes me to not just copy her or try to act in the way she acts, but go to the Lord and ask him what that looks like in my life. You know, how can I embody that characteristic of his that's expressed in Hannah in that way. Um, I think the thing that Hannah would say is, it's not me, it's Jesus. And I think that's the thing that I would always want to make clear is, Hannah has nothing to offer apart from the Lord. I mean, Jesus did not live life alone. He was God. He did not need other people. And yet he chose to surround himself with these men. He poured himself out for and, um, cared for and interacted with and, you know, spent time in their homes, spent time in celebration with them. And Hannah does those same things. I mean, she's like family to me. As I've watched Hannah do life and live in community, I am encouraged because she's just being a disciple who loves Jesus. Christ Chapel. It's wonderful to be coming to you from the South Campus today. Uh, really excited to be here. It's always fun. And uh, just we truly are one church in uh, different locations. And I uh, just want to say thank you for being uh, not just one church, but a wonderful uh, church. I know many of you uh, just talked about our efforts with uh, it, the relief efforts with Hurricane Helene, and we're going to continue to step into that and want to thank you for doing that and want to encourage you to look at that QR code that's on the back of the sermon notes uh, so that if you would like to, if you're so inclined, if God is pulling at your heart to give to disaster relief so that we can uh, deploy those funds to people in need, then you can get there by scanning that uh, QR code. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, but speaking of QR codes, if you scanned that QR code, and you got a message that said, uh, you are automatically entered to win, uh, what would you think? Uh, you would first be confused, uh, certainly, and you, you should, because that's not what you're scanning the QR code uh, for. You would be confused, but you would also be probably skeptical, because anytime you see that message, you think it's a scam. I mean, you, you're like, there's, there's no way. One, I don't wanna be entered into anything. By the way, we don't sell your information. We don't give your information away. I just want to, to let you know that and assure you it stays with us. Because if you got that message, you would think this is, this is not right. This is not good. I don't want to be entered into that. And even if I was automatically entered to win, if something is so generic like that, where you, everyone is automatically entered to win, then I probably won't. I mean, because there's just the, the odds are, are so, so slim because there's, there's too many people that would be automatically entered that I would probably never win. But when it comes to Christianity, you are automatically entered to win. And what I mean by that is when you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, when you place your faith in him, you are not only entered into a right relationship with a holy God, you are automatically entered into a fellowship, a body of believers, a community, a, a fellowship, what we call the body of Christ. All of those are synonymous. And you're entered into this, this group, this community, so that you will win. It, it's, it's for your good. You see, when you begin a relationship with him, you're automatically entered into the fellowship and you will win. But if you say, Cody, if you tell me that I'm winning, why do I feel like I'm losing? Now, some people do feel like they're, they're losing because they don't have that connection 
They don't have that, that fellowship. They don't have that sense of uh, belonging. Uh, but actually, uh, it's funny, a secular study that was done by uh, Harvard tells us that attending church is actually good for your health. It, it, it is, it's very good for your health. Those who regularly attend church, it says the divorce rate is cut in half. It says it reduces your stress by 55%. If, you, if, if I told you anything you could do for free that would reduce your stress for 55, by 55%, you'd go, sign me up. You'd want to be automatically entered to, to win with that. Uh, and it actually reduces the uh, rate that someone would take their own life by 84%. So th this, that's just regular church attendance. But we also know that just attending isn't enough because it's not just the quantity of relationships. It's not just osmosis that, that helps you. It's actually the, the quality of your relationships, the amount, uh, the, the depth of the connection that you have that makes a difference because today there is a loneliness epidemic I've referenced this once before, but in 2023, the Surgeon General put out a study that was talking about how lonely people in our country are today. Uh, one out of three adults say that they are lonely at least once a week. That, that doesn't mean that it's like, oh, I'm just lonely in this, you know, five minutes. It means that I feel like I don't have anyone. And it's not just I'll see somebody at work tomorrow. It is... I don't feel connected in any way. I don't feel like anybody knows me. I don't feel like anyone cares. And the shocking part about that is, and what reinforces that idea, is that 80% of those under the age of 18 say that they're lonely. And, and actually 73% of those who are 27 to 43 say that they're lonely. They don't have these meaningful connections. They feel isolated and alone. They don't feel known. They don't have the quality of relationships that God created us for. Because remember, from the very beginning in Genesis chapter 2, God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. Now, so often, that's, people equate that with marriage, and absolutely, that certainly applies in that context. But what if that is just true at its basic level? I think he affirms that throughout Scripture, that it's not good for us to be alone, and I will show you that from the rest of the Scriptures that we'll look at today. But if you will, open your Bibles, please. Open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, it's page 1023, 1023, if you're opening one of the Blue Bibles, no matter which venue you're in today. And we're going to talk about how uh, a regular habit of a disciple of Jesus is to connect in deep and meaningful Christian relationships. That, that we would connect in deep and meaningful relationships. That's a regular habit. As we talk about seven core habits of a disciple of Jesus. Remember, that's what we're covering in this series of what does it mean to be a disciple. And in week one, we talked about how that begins with believing. It begins by believing in Jesus. That's how that relationship begins as you follow Jesus. You have to believe in Jesus to follow him, believing that he is the way, the truth, and the life. That's what we talked about in week one. Week two was learn. A disciple learns because we expect it. I, I think scripture tells us that we should constantly be growing in Christ. Now, you can't grow yourself but you can learn about him. As Paul tells us, uh, we can water and we can plant those seeds and things, but God causes the growth. But when we are in his word regularly, learning about who he is, his living and active word, he grows us. He grows us in our spiritual maturity. So a regular habit of a disciple is to continue to learn about him. And then last week we talked about prayer, this connection with a relational God where we are dependent upon him for our needs, but we remember that he is a good father who is a sovereign king that we can always connect to and relate to. We can always converse with. That's a regular habit of a disciple. And so 
Today, though, we're going to kind of, kind of make a turn, make a, make a shift as we start going through these seven core characteristics of a disciple and these daily habits of what it means to follow Jesus. Because if, the first, if you take the first three and you just look at them from a 50,000-foot view, then they pretty much are uh, private in a sense, if you think about that. Like believing, I, I can believe and you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know. I can read my Bible and nobody would necessarily see. I can pray. In fact, one of the scriptures we talked about last week was go and pray in secret. Don't, don't pray like the hypocrites out on the corner. So it's kind of the, 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 be, the beginning of those habits are definitely regular habits, but sometimes they're more privatized. But the faith that we have in Jesus by believing and learning and growing and praying should work itself out and should spill over into our regular lives where other people can see that we are followers of Jesus. And the first place that shows up is in our relationships. And I want to show you that turn because that turn kind of comes, uh, 1 John chapter 4 shows us that turn where that, that private belief that what, what you believe in your heart and mind deep in your soul plays itself out in how you relate to other Christians. So 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12, uh, just follow along with me because I just want to uh, read it as a, as a whole if, if that's okay. It says, beloved, let us love one another for love is from God and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And in this love, in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the, the payment for our sins. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, then God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And may God bless the reading of his word. May our hearts be open to hear from him. We're going to stop there for today. So, what First John is doing, what John is doing here is he's telling us how that, that belief in who God is overflows into our relationship with other people. That if we believe that God so loved us, that he loved us, that he sent his only son, that he is the propitiation, he's the payment, he's the one who bridges the gap so that we can be in a right relationship with the holy God. If he loved us that way, if he had that relationship with us in that way, then we also, as verse 11 says, ought to love one another with that same kind of love. Because if we know God's love, then we give God's love. That, that, that's the, the natural flow for someone who is in a relationship with God. And so who do we love? We love those who are in our context. So what I want to do is I want to walk through this because this is exactly what Jesus was praying for in John chapter 17, is that those who believe in him would be one. Do you remember, do you remember this? He said, he said, Father, may they be one like you and I are one. May they be so connected, so uh, intertwined. May, may they love one another and be so unified in their mission, in their purpose, in their sacrifice and love for one another that that's what we're going to look at today is what does that love look like as we are called to love one another, love other uh, believers. And so I wanna, wanna go through that of how we're supposed to connect in relationships with other Christians because in the New Testament, there is no category for a lone ranger Christian. It, it, it doesn't exist. Christians are always meant to be in relationship with one another. Always. That's what we see all throughout the, the New Testament and obviously uh, the, the Old Testament fellowship as well. And so we're going to go through these different kinds of uh, reasons why we connect. And I'll give you some ways uh, to connect as well. But uh, just a quick caveat here for just a second. Because as we talk about connecting in relationships, 
um, the extroverts in the room are going, I mean, they're cheering right now. You are super excited. You're amening. And all of you introverts, your palms are sweaty. And if you could leave the room without drawing attention to yourself right now, you would, okay? But uh, this is not about connecting in extroverted ways. That's not what I, I'm talking about here. In fact, extroverts, sometimes you're a bit much. Let's just be honest, okay? This is not about connecting in an extroverted way. This is not trying to make you into someone you're not. However, let me say this, that your personality is not supposed to trump your spirituality. You're, we're going to talk a little bit more about your personality next week, but your personality does not trump your spirituality. So we're not going to talk about connecting as extroverts or introverts in those particular ways. We're going to talk about connecting in a Christian way. What does it mean as a believer to connect as we talk about why and how. So the first reason why a disciple connects to other Christians is this. A, a disciple connects to other Christians to express God's love to one another. A disciple connects to other Christians to express God's love to one another. I, I've, I've tried to think about how to very simply put this. When I talk about express, it, it's a way that we express God's love um, it, it's a very simple concept of, of overflowing. It, it's, it's an overflow that the love that we have from God, the love that we have for God overflows onto those around us. We, we, we just, we can't contain it. And I know I gave you an analogy last week when we were talking about prayer, about the more you know God, the more you want to talk to God. And I used the analogy of when I first started dating Jen and how, you know, I, the more I learned about her, the more that I wanted to, to talk with her. But I'll use that same analogy with this love that overflows. Because one of the things that uh, was reflected back to me when I first started dating Jen was I took her home to go meet my folks, and my mom said, you are so much nicer to us. <laughs> and I was like, okay, what does that mean? That means that, and you've been around those people where it's like they are so in love with that other person that they're just nicer to everybody else. And you're like, please keep hanging around them, you know, because you're nicer. It's that overflow. It's that overflow of, I am just so filled up that it overflows onto other people. And that's this love that we're talking about from 1 John chapter 4. This love that God has poured into our own hearts overflows onto other Christians. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through or 7 and 12. We'll just reference it again. It says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Does that, that means that if you don't love other people, you need a heart check on how your relationship is with the Lord. Go, go back, ch check the dash. You, you, you need to, to check yourself. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, then God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. See, one of the things that we've talked about, and really one of the reasons why we're in this entire series, if you remember where we jumped off was in Romans chapter 12, where we are called to be, in light of God's mercy, a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual, or this is your only reasonable way to live if you know that God has changed your life as a living sacrifice. And we talked about how sometimes that can be pretty nebulous, but really the way that we put shoe leather to that, where the rubber meets the road of being a living sacrifice is to love his children, to, to love one another. That's what he's called us to do. What does it mean to be a living sacrifice? We love each other. That, that's why it says no one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, then we know that God abides in us. The way that we show our love for God is to love his kids. That, it, it's, it's as simple as that. And, and you know this because you, you have friends like this where you are very good friends maybe with, with the parents. 
And sometimes, the, you know, with the parents, the way that you love those parents is to love their kids. And when you love their kids, and, and, and those people that love your kids, if you have children, if, if they love your kids, you love them. I mean, you're like, man, I'm so thankful, would, would, would die for them, for the way that they love and build up uh, my kids. Uh, you cannot love Christ and not love his children. It, it, you can't. That's a, it's, a, it's a non sequitur. That's what he's talking about here is we love God by loving his kids. So, you know, coming up on Christmas time here, and oftentimes, you know, you hear the question, what do you give to the person who has everything? You know, what do you give to God who has everything? You love his kids. That, that's what it is. That you, you love the ones that he Loves And so, in fact, that's what, just an aside, quickly, isn't that what Jesus is telling Peter in John chapter 21? Do you remember that? Remember when, when Jesus is asking Peter, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, of course I do. Then what does Jesus say? Feed my sheep. Go love my kids. Like, you can sit here and tell me all day long that, that you love me, and, I, and, I, and I'm great with that. But you want to show me that you love me? then go love my kids. Go, go, go love my, my children. And so I wanna give you some, some very practical ways to do that as Christ followers in uh, the, the family that we call uh, Christ Chapel, but the community of believers. So I wanna give you some ways to express God's love to one another because the New Testament specifically is filled with these what we call one another statements of ways we're supposed to interact with or treat one another. There's over 50 one another statements in, in the New Testament. The most consistent one, the most common one is love one another. Now, again, that can be a little bit abstract sometimes. And so I'm gonna break it down and make it very practical and concrete for these variety of, of ways that we can express God's love to one another. So the first one is very simple, and it's speak it. Speak it. Just speak it. Words matter. Words absolutely matter. And you know that, that old phrase, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. It's a lie. It's a lie. And every single one of you can think of someone who said something to you that wasn't a stick or a stone, but it hurt you badly. Words matter. And this is one of the reasons why we get one another in the, in the almost negative sense in the New Testament where it says, you know, don't gossip about one another. Don't speak evil of one another. Don't provoke one another. So there are some one another's that say, stay away from that danger zone when you speak to people. But it also has some very positive ways to speak to people about encouraging them, of building them up, of telling them the great things that you, you see in them, telling them uh, the things that you appreciate about them. And, and very, very simply, let me just give you a few statements that um, I'm going to encourage you to use one of these with another believer this week, okay? First one, I love you. Just simple. And you, you might tell that to your family, but do you tell it to other believers that you love them? That's, that's what we're supposed to do is love one another. I love you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. That's it. This is also applies to marriage, too. Uh, if you need to apply this to marriage, then you have double homework, okay? Uh, please forgive me. That, that should follow, I'm sorry. Okay, please forgive me. If it's a sin issue, please forgive me. And then I forgive you. Four very powerful statements that will express love to one another. So speak it. That's a way to express love to one another. The second is show it. Show it. Why, why do we say speak it, then show it? Because actions speak louder than words. If you, tell, if you tell somebody you're sorry today and then you do the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day, they'll stop believing you're sorry. 
So show it. So we've, we, we've got to show it to one another. Um, so when we talk about one of the, uh, the one another's in scripture, the place that oftentimes people go to when we talk about community and showing that kind of love and belonging that we all want and desire is in Acts chapter two, verses 42 and 47, when the church is birthed and it says that all the believers were together and had everything in common, that they shared everything. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching. They were devoted to breaking bread. They were eating in one another's homes. Like it, it, it was wonderful. That's a way to, to show it. So I'll give you a very, two very practical ways. First one is hospitality. Invite someone over. Invite another believer over to, to your home. Uh, a second way to show it, and this kind of uh, is a positive way to go against a negative. Uh, one of the one another's that uh, talks about in the New Testament is don't envy one another. And so one of the ways that you can show that you don't envy another believer is to celebrate them. Celebrate another believer. When something great happens in their, their life, celebrate them. Uh, write, write them a card, write them a note, uh, call them up, take them to dinner, take them a balloon, I mean, take them a cupcake, Se- just celebrate them. And I, wh- because remember, when we talk about being a part of a body, and we're going to talk more about this next week, um, but when Paul's describing the body of Christ, he says, when one part suffers, we all suffer. When, when, when one, one part is celebrated, we should all celebrate. I am happy for you. I'm happy for what God is doing in your life. Show it. Celebrate those other believers. Lift them up. And then finally, the last way is sacrifice for it. Sacrifice for it. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, it says that we are called to bear one another's burdens. And you need a deeper dive into this. But one of the ways that we show our love for other believers is we sacrifice to help them carry their burdens. And those can be emotional burdens, those can be spiritual burdens, those can be financial burdens, those can, I mean, physical burdens. Uh, how, how can you step in and sacrifice? It's not the most convenient for you. I, I get that. You know, it, you might be sacrificing your time to go and be present with someone. You might be sacrificing your finances and you might give to something that they they need. Um, I don't know what those sacrifices are, but we are called to carry one another's burdens. And as uh, Doug Cecil has taught me before, uh, a burden shared is a burden halved, cut in half. We aren't called to carry these burdens alone, and that's why God puts us in community with one another to carry one another's burdens so we don't carry these things alone. So uh, the application is this. Connect with other Christians to represent Christ's love. Connect with other Christians to represent Christ's love. Now, very quickly, some of you are feeling overwhelmed because you're like, oh my gosh, I'm thinking of so many different ideas of ways that I need to connect with people and speak and show and sacrifice and uh, and you're just, you're just on tilt right now. Um, let, let me just calm you down for just a second and say, uh, th- where you need to begin are those who are within your context. Just begin with those who are in your context. And the reason why I say that is, one, because if God put them in your context, then God has probably called you to care for them. Second reason why I say that is because sometimes it's easier for us to love those we don't know than it is to care for those ones that we do. And oftentimes, if we start reaching beyond our context to love those that we don't know very well, it crushes those who are in our context who do need to be loved because they're going, wait, you just skipped over me. What, what, about, what about me? And so just, just start in your context. Start very simply connecting with other Christians to represent Christ's love. And one of the wonderful things about that is about the body of Christ. Oftentimes, uh, what goes around comes around, which leads us to our second point that a disciple connects to other Christians to experience God's love themselves. A disciple connects to other Christians to experience God's love themselves. 
uh, Christian community is oftentimes undervalued until it's needed. And then when you need it, you go, where is everybody? The time to build relational bridges is not in the midst of the storm. Uh, we've just talked about Hurricane Helene. They didn't take on a big a building project to infrastructure to build bridges and things in the middle of the storm. They're using those bridges that were built before the storm to go and help people now. That, that's, it's the same relational bridges. Those relational bridges are built now, but they're built to help care for one another. Ecclesiastes chapter four, verses nine through 12. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. And he doubles down. Again, if, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Uh, I love how it talks about the threefold cord because I think that uh, that is defining the distinct Christian relationship. It's three, straight, three people in the relationship. It's me, you, and it's Jesus. That's the, the tie that, that binds. And I'm not saying anything ill or bad about the high school friend that you've had for 30 years. I'm not saying that at all. But I will, I will tell you this, with friends that, that I have, I have wonderful friends who are not believers and there is, there's a place where it just, that relationship can't go deeper. Like there, there's a, just a place where they don't, he doesn't understand me. I, I don't know how else to, to say that in a loving and kind way. Um, and I continue to share the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. But um, that's the relationship that, the tie that binds, the cord of three strands that's not easily broken is one, a friendship, a relationship, the community that's built on Christ. And I know some of you are saying, Cody, I am a part of the community. Um, I'm a part of Band of Brothers. I'm a part of Women in the Word, but I'm, I come to church, I do these things, and I just, I still feel uh, lonely. Well, let me, let me say this. One, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you for your faithfulness. God bless you. Please continue to press in. Uh, but l let's talk about a mindset for just a second. Because what I have found, and this is just anecdotal, what I have found personally is when I come into a relationship looking for what I can get, I am oftentimes disappointed. When I enter into a relationship looking for ways I can give, I am oftentimes surprised. I'm oftentimes surprised about what I, I get in return when I'm just looking to, to give. And so maybe there's a little bit of a mindset shift that you can do as you enter into a community uh, here at Christ Chapel. So here's the admonition. Connect with other Christians to receive Christ's love. Connect with other Christians to receive Christ's love. Again, thinking a little bit about what you can give, which we'll talk more about uh, next week. But this is a way where you can feel and experience the, in, in a sense, you'll get what I'm saying here, and if you don't, give me grace. The invisible love of God becomes tangible in the community of Christ. The, you say, we, we intellectually go, I know God loves me, but I don't feel it. Then get a hug. Like, God does love you, and that's why he puts us around each other so that his invisible attributes, his love can be experienced by the fellowship through the fellowship so that we can love one another. So connect with other Christians to receive Christ's love. And then finally, a disciple connects to other Christians to exhibit God's love to others. A disciple connects to other Christians to exhibit God's love to others. And when I say exhibit, you could have easily put in the word display, but I had ease in the blanks. So I had to just keep the ease. I had to keep alliteration. I'm a, I'm a nerd. I get it. I get it. It's okay. So it's the way that we display God's love 
to the world around us. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter 13. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35, he says, a new uh, option I give to you. Okay, is anybody reading there? No, a new commandment I give to you. It's an expectation that we love one another. This is, he, put, he puts us in community to love one another. How? Just as he loved us. You ought to love one another. And here's a byproduct of that. By this, by what? By the love that you show to one another, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. The way that, that we love one another in genuine Christian relationships is a witness to this world of God's unconditional love to us. That's available to them. That's a defining characteristic. It should be magnetic to the world around us that they go, I don't understand that kind of community. I don't have that because their love is being spoken. Love is being shown. Love is being sacrificed for, and that's foreign to many people in this world. And he's saying, this is how the world will know that you are mine. So the application is connect with other Christians to reach others with Christ's love. Connect with other Christians to reach others with Christ's love. I say this for a couple reasons. First, when Jesus sent out the disciples, he sent them out two by two. Not because he was mimicking Noah's Ark, okay? But because that Ecclesiastes, two are better than one. If one falls down, there's somebody. They were, they were meant to encourage one another. But here's what I've seen as uh, Christians reach out to other folks uh, around them when, when we do it in the context of community. First, uh, we is better than me. We can do more collectively than we can individually, just as we're talking about even relief efforts uh, these days. So we is always better than me. We can go further uh, together. But also something else that I found uh, that's key to the community reaching the 800,000 in our own backyard who don't know or walk with Jesus is this, that not everyone is like me. Not, that's, that's why it takes a community. And, and I, I see it, uh, I just heard this story from our men's mission trip that went to uh, Brazil about how uh, guys on the mission trip had different experiences that connected with people that they were ministering to. And it was like, oh my gosh, that person that was there in Brazil, they just had a relative die from cancer. One of the guy's uh, wives had just died from cancer. And so they were able to connect. And it's God uses that, that varied experience to reach out to those around us because not everybody is like you and not everybody is like me. That's why it takes we. That's why it takes a, a community. That's why connecting should be a regular habit of a healthy disciple. And so I wanna just end with this admonition from Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, it's not on your sermon notes, but Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 through 25. Uh, put it to memory, go back and, and read it. But it says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promises faithful and let us consider how to stir up one another toward love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some. It's a habit of isolation for some, but he said, no, 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 make it a habit to meet together, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. Let me pray for us. God, I thank you that you put us in a community with other believers who love us the way that uh, you loved us, that, that, that put hands, feet, eyes, smiles, hugs to your love for us, Lord. Uh, we, we need that kind of support. We need that kind of encouragement. We need that belonging, that connection. And so, oh Lord, would you stir in us not only the conviction, but the love 
that we have for you to pour out love to your children, that we would make it a regular habit to connect. And we ask in Jesus' name, amen. to show his grace to others and that overflowing as Cody talked about. Uh, so let's sing of it now. Would you stand? We'll sing together. We're called to be his people. We are called to be God's people showing by our lives his grace one in heart and one in spirit, sign of hope for all the race. Let us show how he has changed us and remade us as his own. Let us share our life together as we shall love. Praise the Lord. Uh, what an incredible uh, truth we have. What an incredible challenge we also have to speak the love of Jesus to other people, to show it, to sacrifice for them. And praise God that doesn't come from us just being good enough, from us just gritting our teeth and trying to love people more, but from responding, like we heard today, for how we are loved, for the sacrifice that was given, responding and abiding in that and letting him work through us. That is encouraging. Uh, I'm not sure where you're at, but if you need to take a next step, you feel conviction in your life through this sermon, through the testimonies we saw in baptism, if the Holy Spirit's doing something in your life and you want more clarity of what that next type, step might be, there's some leaders right outside this door. They'd love to talk with you. They'd love to walk you through ways to get deeper discipled or get plugged in. Uh, we'd love to walk with you. If there's prayer, we would love to pray for you. If there's any needs that we can carry, we'll be down front. Also, remember, I want to put on your radar, next Sunday, October 20th, we'll have uh, a time of elder praying. So put that on your schedule if that's something you'd like to be a part of after this service next Sunday. The elders will be down front, and they would also love to pray for you. If you, if you know somebody who's disconnected from community, remember, invite them. Bring them in. We, we saw stories of that, of just the power of inviting somebody into the family of God, uh, not just so they can be a, a part of a neat community, but so they can see and understand the gospel in an eternal way. Uh, also, remember the 5 o'clock. We're there every week down there. And so uh, if you can't make the morning, then come there. Church, we love you. We love you a lot. God bless you. We'll see you soon. We're really glad you joined in today and hope your faith is encouraged as you head into the rest of Sunday and into this next week. We're still here to pray with you before you go, and you can always reach out if we can help at all or pray for you during the week. Until we're back together, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday.